and find it in a leaf spring. I played a neat trick right in the yard behind my house. I planted a lollipop stick and every day I watered it well and washed it carefully. I hoped one day the stick would grow to be a lollipop tree. Oh, ha, 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 ho, 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 ho. What a place to be under my lollipop, 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 lolly, lolly, lollipop tree. It was 1889. A young missionary arrived at the end of a long journey from Scotland in one of the most remote and yet beautiful parts of the world. The place was called Kalimpong, in the high Himalayas of India. The tales of the great missionary explorers kept Victorian Britain enthralled, and John Anderson Graham offered his own services to the Church of Scotland, who chose to send him to this remote outpost of the British Empire. He took over a parish which covered 1,000 square miles, stretching over a landscape from Tibet to the hot plains below, as romantic a vista as you'll find anywhere in the world. But during his travels through the tea plantations in the foothills, Graham found a sickness in the heart of this paradise. He discovered the sad plight of the children, born of the coolie women who worked on the estates, and the Europeans who were not allowed to marry until they became managers. Graham loved children. In 1900, in Kalimpong, he started a home for six of these destitute Eurasians, a scheme which in fact snowballed into a plan for a new life for hundreds of them. The children had led a miserable existence, rejected by their father's society, often outcast by the Hindu society of their mothers. But Graham felt that in the ethereal surroundings and climate of Kalimpong, the change to a better life might begin. Within sight of Tibet, Nepal, Bhutan, and Sikkim, Kalimpong lay on the threshold of the closed lands, mountain kingdoms that did not permit entry to foreigners. Such was the vision of the man that he began by leasing 560 acres on the top of a bare hill, on which during the next 42 years, he was to build what became known as the children's village of the Himalayas. 70 years later, Dr. Graham's homes have opened their doors to 800 children of many nationalities and religions. Anglo-Indian, Tibetan, Bhutanese, Sikhamese, Nepalese, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, and Muslims. This story is of four of these children and of the lollipop tree, its roots planted deep in the hillside above Kalimpong. My memories of India are childhood ones. I can remember flying kites in Calcutta, and I had a mum and dad who loved me. Looking back, I suppose I was privileged. I couldn't know how many desperately unhappy children there were around me. Mary Mannering, Anglo-Indian, aged nine years. When Mary came here, she was very, very thin, in very poor health. She was very frightened. At night, she had terrible nightmares, screaming in the night. And one had to go and waken her and put one's arm around her and tell her that she was in a home now with those who loved her. Every day, she would talk about the awful time she had in Calcutta with her stepmother. Oh, one, one day, my stepmother beat me up. Beat me up. And... Uh, and... Uh, Never gave any food to eat, and I was awful hungry and all dirty clothes. And all. 
Then one day she sent me to go and get some cigarettes and when I was running across the road, a car ran over me and I had to go to the hospital and the nurses and the doctor asked to leave me and... Were you um, badly hurt? Yes. Then I have to have on a plaster from my wrist right up to my thighs. Her mother is dead. Her own mother is dead. Her stepmother does not love her. Her father is alive, but he takes no interest in her. The only person who takes an interest in her is her grandmother. But she can't do anything. She is so very poor. Dickie Topke, Tibetan refugee aged five years. She was born in Kalampong, a Buddhist. The child of a commissioner of a district of eastern Tibet until the Chinese invasion. Mother, a Tibetan from Lhasa. Nisa Arif, Indian, aged 18, born in Assam. Her father, a Pathan from the northwest frontier. Religion, Mohammedan. The day begins in the children's village at Kalampong, a home without parents. Kenneth McLean, Anglo-Indian, aged 18, Episcopalian, born in Calcutta. The parents separated and abandoned their child in the homes in 1959. No, my parents are in, one is in Birmingham, the other is in London. I don't know what they're doing exactly. Dr. Graham died in 1942. And for the last 10 years, the task of weaving his policies into the rapidly changing fabric of Indian society has been taken over by James Minto, the son of a minister from St. Andrews in Scotland. I thought in other schools where the involvement was not on the same emotional level. These children need help, need assistance, need love. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Angelo. Good morning, sir. And I have... I'd like to think become a sort of father figure for a number of them who have no parents of their own. I think any child in need that I meet elsewhere will constantly remind me of these children here in, in the home. much more at home here in Kalampong or in Calcutta than I do in Edinburgh or St Andrews where my hometown is. Well, how did the exam go yesterday, Pam? Very good. What essay did you write? What I should like to be when I leave school. Mm. Many of you got exams next week. All of you? All of you? Yes. You're very busy studying, I see, huh? <laughs> uh, incidentally, Sonam, I brought the photograph of Dr. Graham that you, you asked for. It's rather a nice one. It's one of my favorite ones of him, actually. Did you ever know Dr. Graham? No, unfortunately, I never had that privilege, Sonam. He, he died in 1942. He's a remarkable man, fantastic person, really. And the idea was that he wanted to bring these children, who had never known what it was to have a home life, bring them into the cottages here and create a home life for them. In other words, he got foster parents, house mothers and house fathers, house aunties, as we call them here, to look after the children and to make them feel as if they were very important, make them feel that they belonged. Now, Graham's basic idea was that children could be changed. 
Lives which otherwise would be distorted by harsh conditions could be given purpose if there was first a change in environment. At the heart of this change was the family. He recreated a family unit to fill this vacuum in the lives of the children. Now he took over an idea which was already working in Scotland and developed a cottage system. Units of 30 children supervised by foster parents. Now I know this thing worked because up until recently I had an aunt in Cullenpong who worked for nearly 10 years as a cottage auntie. India was a country which relied heavily on its servants at all levels. But Graham decreed that there would be no servants, that no work would be considered menial, that all would respect the dignity of labor. and a home. They also see that you are on your feet and you can live like any other person. In spite of the fact that you may come from a broken home or you may be an orphan like many of our boys are. Daddy Graham, as he was called, became the supreme father figure, presiding with his wife over a family hierarchy in which the older children looked after the younger ones. And love, care and mutual help were the watchwords. What is it? But the idea of self-reliance extended beyond the walls of each cottage. The whole village was to be self-supporting, and that meant starting a farm, which now provides much of the food for the children. A model farm which employs 80 of the 1,500 Nepalese staff on the estate and gives them homes, medicine, and free schooling for their children. Joe McDonald, the assistant farm manager, is a member of a famous family in the hills. And he'll tell you that people come from far and wide to see the farm at Kalampong. going to Kolkata this week, A.B.? I'm just kidding. You think good this week? Mm -hmm. You've got to watch the breed for other people, you know? Five kids he's going in. 75 days. Uh -huh. Is it all good? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. It seems quite fun. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because once we had a complaint, you know, and yes. we've got to always be very careful. Mm -hmm. yes, the girls know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Splendid. John Webster, who runs the farm, is a qualified agriculturalist, as well as the chaplain to the homes. Okay, driver. This is cheese going to go cutter. A luxury product, but very important to the farm. Two. Two. The cattle here would lose money, but for the cheese that is produced. But cheese isn't the only thing that's produced here. We have sheep, we're starting a pilot scheme. Trying to get wool, sure. trying to get mutton. Sure. We produce milk, we produce butter, vegetables and eggs, all in an attempt to feed the 600, 700 children that live here. This, in a sense, is one flock I look after, the children are the other. Good food, clean air and kindness. A magic world for the children of the plantations and a secure base for their future lives. <laughs> 
Every normal person likes a home, and a home is built not just by one person, it's built by a husband and wife with children. And I have the same desire that I'll settle down sometime in life, but I only hope it's the right man. Dr. Graham's care for his children was a practical matter. He built a hospital where the older girls trained to be nurses. But the wounds of a harsher childhood are not so easy to heal. I really admire those who have fathers. Fathers they could be proud of, because I don't have one. Not one to be proud of. My father was a drunkard and a waster. It was he who, who was the main head of the split up of our family. It was he that we really curse because I have no love for him anymore. The problems of the Anglo-Indian go deep into the history of British rule in India. During Dr. Graham's life, the British Empire was very much a reality and his students, at that time Anglo-Indian, were taught to be useful servants of the crown. Hello, baby. Their education was Western, and their identification was with Britain. There was no question of their being brought up as citizens of India, a subject country. But since India's independence in 1947, there has been a drastic change of policy in order to encourage the children to play their part in India as Indian citizens. Bernard Brooks, the headmaster, is an Anglo-Indian himself and comes from a distinguished Anglo-Indian family. When he takes over soon as principal, the wheel of Indianization, first wrought by Gandhi, will have turned full circle Ten years ago, most of the staff were Europeans. Now there is only one left, out of 45 teachers. This exhibition has been compiled by the senior children in our academic stream, working towards the Indian school certificate examination. Gandhiji, to set an example to the, to the Indian mass, he, he spun his own clothes and wore them. This shows how simple a man he was. The Anglo-Indians, that community which has been buffeted between East and West for two centuries, have until the last few years considered themselves to be British. But the Western education of pre-independence has now been replaced by a study of India, of its history and of its vernacular languages, so as to encourage Anglo-Indians to be Indians and proud of it. All the students learn Hindi and a regional language. And of course, in keeping with the national policy, they are taught in English. exams at Kalimpong. For some of the children with undernourished brains, there could be no competition for entry. 
40% of the children still have impoverished backgrounds, and the average IQ is not high. Despite this, though, the home's pass rate in the Indian school certificate is higher than the national average and does improve year by year. pioneer in comprehensive education. He recognized that not all children were equipped for academic studies, and for those that were not, he designed a second stream of training in crafts. Boys can learn motor mechanics, woodwork, and mechanical engineering. Since 1900, over 5,000 students have passed through the homes. It's not all been a success story. Naturally, some have fallen by the wayside. but. A rough guess, I would say that 85% have found success and happiness in afterlife. The great thing now about the homes is that the students are prepared for life in India, and this is very important. They leave here proud of the fact that they are citizens of this great land. And with the values that we have been able to give them, values of you know, training and industry, they have a great contribution to make to this developing country. We try to teach the children in the cottages to realize that no job is beneath them, that any job that is honest is worthwhile. The girls have a wider choice. Nursing, a commercial course in shorthand and typing, hairdressing, and childcare. Getting a job in India is not always easy, but these children are fit to survive and the homes have made themselves responsible for finding all of them jobs when they leave. The children now are being prepared for the Indian environment in a way which will make them useful citizens, which will make them not strangers in their own country as they tended to be 15 or 20 years ago. Physical education was a crucial part of Dr. Graham's scheme. The rebuilding of bodies shattered by squalor and neglect.
very young age, I started playing in the school team for hockey and netball because I loved it. And once you enjoy something, you can put into it as much. And so, obviously, when I enjoyed it, I played better and I was taken in to be in the school team. And then later, of course, basketball came on, volleyball and everything. And many of the stories told about Daddy Graham. One delightful one is that at the opening of the swimming pool, where he was dressed in his full regalia of frock coat and top hat, he said, I declare the swimming pool open and jumped fully clad into the swimming pool. John Anderson Graham was an exceptional man. But he had in fact started his life in Kalimpong as the conventional, perhaps rather narrow missionary of that time. But gradually he broadened through contact with the other great religions and of course the people of India. His feeling for humanity, his sense of brotherhood flourished under the shade of his lollipop tree. For him, as for his friend, the great Indian thinker Tagore, religion was not to be doled out in fixed measures. He felt that it was the center of gravity of our lives. Now we'll all get ready to sing the last carol. Louder. Louder. Robert, can Mary? worship him in Mary. their own way. So bring your gifts and leave them near. Baby Jesus lying here. Sit down. Now go back. Some yes. shepherd sat upon a hill. The air was damp, the night was chill. At once a great light shone around. In fear they fell upon the ground. And then they saw some angels there. The heavenly and heavenly music in the air. Graham would have approved that there were now Hindus, Buddhists and Mohammedans as well as Christians at Kalimpong. Religion and a sense of God flourish in an atmosphere of debate and inquiry within a Christian framework. Oh, why don't you there? But, uh, uh, that's that's yeah, it, it, the last year my mother spent such a lot of money in buying this uh, round thing, which is called money. Money, money? No, no. Money, money, money. money. M-A-N-I. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. Okay. Had my mother spend, uh, spend those money, that money, for uh, helping poor, poor people, it could, you know, we would have served our fellow men. Every politician stand up and say that we should help our fellow men. There's a constant exchange of views about life, and ideas are discussed with the intensity of young people who really want to know the answers. Graham felt that human love could go just so far within the homes, but without a sense of divine love in the harsher world outside, his children might suffer. service in the memorial chapel, the children approach their God. Through education, they are taught to believe in him, in God as the father of all men. 
And though this awareness is encouraged through a knowledge of Jesus Christ and identification with his suffering, there is plenty of room for dissent. John Webster, the chaplain, guides the children along this difficult road, a road which is strewn with the pitfalls of dogma. To say that all spiritual paths, all religious paths, are leading to the same goal is, is not for me to judge. No one has come back from the hereafter to tell us who has arrived, as it were, and, and, and who hasn't. If a Buddhist scholar, if a Hindu scholar comes to me and says he wants to be a Christian, then I'm going to encourage him with all my heart. But at the same time, the Buddhist in his own way and the Hindu in his own way is making his peace with God. And I've met some very, very spiritually filled Hindus and spiritually filled Buddhists. But ideally followed and completely followed and a life completely given to Jesus Christ, I am absolutely convinced is the answer and I believe wholeheartedly that God is totally revealed in Jesus Christ and here is the answer and the only answer. But never would I want to detract a boy of any um, spiritual path on which he is embarked. A group of senior girls sing the beautiful hymn to God which was Gandhi's favorite. The hymn which demonstrated the universality of God, Hindu or Mohammedan. <laughs> children appear to accept a Christian framework to their lives in Kalimpong. Through living, praying and discussing together, they become perhaps more aware of the universal nature of God and of his relevance to each one of them. The story of the lollipop tree is the story of the integration of six national groups and four religions. These Buddhist children come from Bhutan. They're on Indian government grants. And when they return to Bhutan, they'll probably become doctors and teachers. <laughs> Hindus from Bengal and Indians from north, south, east and west. And they're free to reaffirm their roots and culture.
Tibetans who left their country in thousands in 1959 sing of the gold in the earth of Tibet, just across the mountains, and of their longing to return. Here there are no communal, racial, or religious feuds. Those are symptoms of an adult world, remote from the life in Kalimpong. complex soul of Dr. Graham's homes is revealed in its spiritual life and its joy bursts forth in song and dance. Perhaps its unique heartbeat is best heard at the festival of Diwali. The Nepalese day boys, who are mostly Hindu, arrive at a girl's cottage with dancers and singers to receive the blessings of the girls. Here, surely, is the meaning of integration, a demonstration of human love in innocence when the tikka is given, the sign of eternal brotherhood and sisterhood. For here at Kalampong, all are brothers and sisters, Christian and Hindu, Muslim and Buddhist. You can't really plan your man, like building a castle in there. But I would like someone that, who really loves me. I mean, that's the main thing, that he loves me and I love him. fairy tale village, it's easy to feel the sinews of Dr. Graham's idea binding all close together. And it's far too easy to forget the sadness that lies in the hearts of many of these children. In the middle. Oh. I think many of our children are very, very lonely when they leave their homes. And it's very tough to face life and get through. For this story is also the story of the impoverished Eurasian, the child of a system established by the British which drove a wedge into the Anglo-Indian personality. It's true that the Anglo-Indian is now a fully constituted member of the Indian nation. The minorities are protected in India. And the children at Kalimpong too are being fitted to play their part in India's future. So
When the British left, the Anglo Indians changed their loyalty from British to the Indians because that's where they actually belong, where the loyalty did actually belong. There are successful Anglo Indians in India, but these children come from the lowest end of the economic scale. And for them, the lacerations of the past are deep. For two centuries, their fathers were the executors of the Crown's dirty work. Policemen, soldiers, railway guards, clerks. A labour force whose loyalty was guaranteed. They were favoured by the British, but were never allowed any status as half-breeds. And the Indians feared and disliked them. Dr Graham, whose sympathy with them was profound, believed that the pain could be lessened by a change of environment. Time has moved on. Now there is no room for those who are unprepared for commitment to India. But Kenny stands as a symbol also, a personification of the love of two people of different colours who have dared to bring into the world a challenge to snobbery and racialism. I've been told a boy is a girl. There's sympathy between people at Kalimpong. A framework of authority is there, but within this, there's a contact between adult and child that seems the more rare in a world harassed by the confusions of the generation gap. It's a very different world at Kalimpong from the world of an eight-foot square room in a city slum. But, for some, the harsher realities of life are soon to be faced. Nuranissa's life in the hills is coming to an end and she will shortly leave for Calcutta. I guess because Daddy Graham found the home through love and concern for children, I guess that love is still flowing in the school and it's just the atmosphere of love and concern in the homes that makes everyone fall in love. Not to say that the beauty of the nature around, the majestic grandeur of the Kanchenjunga, but the atmosphere of love, I think, the point that people fall in love with the place. I mean, when I was younger, I, I didn't really know the truth of wanting to stay in, in the home. But the latter years, before leaving the homes, I really felt it. Dr. Graham, the man who loved children, died in 1942 and was buried in Kalimpong alongside his wife, Catherine, who had been his greatest support. He was a great man. The story is told that at a mela, a festival in Kalimpong, that he was seen leaving this mela with his one arm round a governor general and another round a coolie. This was not a pose. This was simply the warmth and the humanity of this rather extraordinary Scotsman, John Anderson Graham. He was joined by James Purdy, a man as meticulous of a detail as Graham was a visionary. The British took much from their Indian Empire. Twenty years after independence, 
Dr. Graham's homes are perhaps one of the legacies of the Raj of which they can be proud. Madam Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit, sister of the late Prime Minister Nehru, is the patroness of the homes. There are Christians, there are Hindus, there are Buddhists, and possibly others also. And uh, whatever may have been the original idea of imposing the Christian religion on children who went to a mission school or mission home, that certainly has vanished with the times. And the good things of Christianity are very apparent in the Graham homes as in many other Christian missions, and that is this compassion which brings people thousands of miles away from their homes in order to care for and help the underprivileged. Uh, they don't impose their religion on any way, but the fact that they themselves are dedicated to uh, the Christian religion which has in it this great force for love and compassion makes them people to whom the child turns. Nur Nisa Arif, the daughter of a Patan, and Kenneth McLean, the Anglo-Indian, have left Kalanpong. Character seems almost a different world. sat for an interview to be a hostess in the Indian section of the Japanese Expo exhibition. Miss Nuranisa Khan, you are going to be an ambassador for India in Expo 70, where we are running a restaurant. Now, do you feel you're qualified to do that job? Yes, I think so. Uh, I would not have applied if I wasn't fit for it. You're 19 years old, Miss Khan. Studied in Kalimpong, Dr. Graham Holmes, is that right? Yes. I studied there. Nuranissa was never to get to Japan. She passed the interview with flying colors, but the scheme unfortunately was abandoned for lack of money. Kenneth started training to be an airline pilot. Uh, you release your brake and taxi out and line up and then open the throttle and take off. When we get to about 500 feet, level off. We'll fly straight and level for a while and do some brake 110. What was started with a sort of limited purpose, a humanitarian purpose, no doubt, but limited to a small section of the community in India, has expanded with the times and is today perhaps a reflection of what the new India is and stands for. After two classes, his flying career came to an end. No one could find the money for him to continue. Life has already knocked them about, but their years in Kalimpong have given them the strength to survive. But in Kalimpong, Dickie at least has a reason to celebrate. <laughs> Everyone takes sugar. One fine day in our new spring, I 
And so it is. But the roots of the lollipop tree are planted deep in the hillside at Kalimpong. Fairy tales are easy to invent. Dr. Graham, the man who loved children, made a fact of his fantasy that those who have and those who lack can together build a basis for their future lives. 